This is also somewhere on that list, but with much less support with 5%. Joining me now is 2024 presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here uh, and engaging us in this conversation. Let me, let me, I want to start with comments you made repeatedly now, referring to Massachusetts Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and author uh, Ibram Kendi as, quote, grand wizards of the modern KKK. Now, I understand you differ with both of them politically and probably with me. But as a graduate of Harvard and Yale universities, I believe you must be aware the Ku Klux Klan is not a political party. It's a terrorist organization. Historians view the Klan as the driving force behind lynchings of blacks in the American South, more than 4,000 people murdered from 1877 to 1950. And the group is linked to numerous other acts of racial violence continuing through the civil rights movement to the present day. You're running to be the leader of the free world. So your choice of words matter. Have you taken any time to reflect upon the possibility that comparing your political rivals to murderous terrorists might put their lives in danger at a time when hate crimes are on the rise? Or do you just don't care? So, so Reverend Sharpton, I don't look at the world through political parties. Frankly, it's good to see it's been 20 years since we last spoke. And part of the reason that I came to that event 20 years ago with you is that you were a political outsider just like I am in my own party. But let me talk about the issue you're actually asking about, which is that, you know, what's toxic about that old world view of organizations like the KKK, which have been a god awful stain on our national history, is that they say that your skin color determines what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to think, to say you have to shut up, sit down and do as you're told because you're black or brown skinned. Well, you know what Ayanna Presley said much more recently is that we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. We don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. And so, yes, I do think there are echoes of a historical ugly racism in this country now showing up in new clothing. To say we and don't want to lead wait, us to wait, as wait, the next wait, president no, just a second. is a to united say that we nation do not want where we black don't actually voices. judge each other on to the color of our skin. To say that is not going with sheets and burning crosses and lynching people. She, if she said something you disagree not, with, the point I'm you, making. The, 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 you cannot equate Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan with somebody saying something that you think is a little controversial or a little too far. S some of our relatives so were Sharpton, terrorized Reverend by the Sharpton, Ku Klux Klan. I, I'm trying to get you to Reverend understand Sharpton, the I know pain you're intellectually of that. honest. I, I know you're an intellectually honest guy, and so I will remind you that Hakeem Jeffries drew analogies between Donald Trump and the Ku Klux Klan, and I don't think you had him on pressing him in the same way. So we're drawing analogies here to he make a point. He did not call Donald the Trump point I'm making, the grand dragon of the KKK. He did not call he Dan, compared Donald, Donald Trump and orders directly of the to the KKK. KKK. Let's not change what was said. And, so, Reverend Sharpton, though, I'm calling out a double standard and saying that certain people can use certain analogies to make a point. Well, I'm using an analogy to make a point. And the point I'm making is we should stop seeing each other on the basis of our skin color. It was god awful when the KKK did it. But you know what? We have to learn a lesson in the present that we're creating more racial division in this country. But you when cannot you say do you have it black skin, you can only think one thing. You cannot do it being insensitive to our feeling. Like, that's that's like calling somebody uh, of any kind of group that had a, a, a group that were terrorizing So I agree with you, we need them. sensitivity. So I think and, we need to be very careful about that. And I wanted to raise that with you directly. We need open let, me, conversations. let me go to my next point. And I, You've and spoken I respect out that you're willing I want to have an get open to your conversation. Campaign, That's but what I want we need to ask you a couple of questions. And one thing you know, if you talked, uh, uh, you mentioned we talked 20 years ago, and I'm going to get to that, but you should have known 20 years ago. You're not going to out-talk me, so let me ask my question. I'll let you talk. Then I'll go back to <laughs> the next It goes both point. ways, yeah. All right. Uh, you've spoken out against affirmative action and diversity programs, even yeah. though it is a reporting in Axios and elsewhere have produced evidence your own former company has been involved in various DEI and ESG initiatives. Your own companies, DEI, diversity. I would hope we can agree yeah. 
that historically many communities of color have not enjoyed the same socioeconomic benefits as white Americans. And many of those disparities persist to this day. What specifically would you do as president to address that problem, keeping in mind your own company got diversity business? Yes, yeah, so, so I want to be very clear about that. After I stepped down as CEO, precisely to speak my mind freely, the company that I founded went the direction of most companies in corporate America. And I disagree with that decision. But you're asking a more important question about what are we going to do to ensure equality of opportunity in this country? You're right. We have been an imperfect nation. I've always said it. But we aspire towards perfection. How do we go that next step? I want to make sure kids aren't trapped in the ghetto of a zip code that they happen to be born in. To the contrary, I think every parent deserves to have the opportunity to send their kids to the best possible school. That's why I favor radical school choice in this country. I think it's a mystery, Reverend Sharpton. The very people who will wax eloquent about systemic racism are also the ones who are opposed to educational mobility. That's why I've said shut down the U.S. Department of Education. Use that $80 billion, put it in the hands of parents so they can actually send their kids to that best possible school they can. But, That's but, the but actual now, civil I, rights I, issue of our time. But, but so I stand minute, for solutions. I stand for equality of opportunity. I, I but I reject race-based quota go, systems. I did not go to Harvard, but I know when a, a question is not answered. I did not ask you about education. I asked you about oh, diversity in business. Yeah. I asked you about a company you had yeah. getting DEI. How do we deal so with here's what the I'm lack? Against. Wait a minute. Let me ask yeah. the question again. How do we deal with Go for it. the economic disparity in businesses of color and people of color in the economic arena? You ran the school choice. Good duck, but wrong show. Deal with the economic. You're well, a businessman. It's, it's actually related. You know, I know you're smarter than this to know that education leads to economic prosperity. So there's no Band-Aid fix. But after you we educated, have we have educated people that, that can't get contracts. In, in we have educated inequality. people that and have so, no problem with, with being educated that can't get contracts. How do you deal with the I'll, inequality in how they do business in this country, how they get jobs? That's where the DEI programs come think, from. So I understand where they come from. I'm against it because it causes us to see one another on the basis of our skin color. I can tell you from personal experience, I have hired both in businesses I've founded, even in this campaign, people who are black executives who have, I think, been unfairly judged. I put them in those positions because of merit. Other people at the companies and otherwise have seen those people as getting that position because of racial quota systems. All right. That is wrong, no matter whether you're black or white. Well, many of I think them we need to go back to colorblind meritocracy. That's what we need in this country. Well, That's how I've led the there, companies I've built. There were many, That's how I will lead this know. country. Color you know that many of them were, were, we were barred and had the merit. But since you talked about experience, I need to show you this tape. Yeah. Back in 2003, when I ran for president and you were there to ask me a question at a forum I was doing at Harvard University. So 20 years later, now my turn to ask. Yeah, let me let me first play you the uh, the tape of you and I 20 years ago. Yeah, let's get the right question here. Go ahead. Reverend Sharpton, hello, I'm Vivek, and I want to ask you, uh, last week on the show we had Senator Kerry, and this week, and, and, and the week before, we had Senator Edwards, and my question for you is, of all the Democratic candidates out there, why should I vote for the one with the least political experience? Well, you shouldn't, because I have the most political experience. <laughs> I got involved in the political uh, movement when I was 12 years old, and I've been involved in social policy for the last 30 years. So don't confuse people that have a job with political experience. So 20 years later, now my turn to ask you, <laughs> of all the Republican candidates out there, why should someone vote for you? The one with the least political experience. And I might add, you've never held <laughs> office. You've only voted twice That's correct. in the last few elections. You don't even vote regularly. Yes. And you support Donald Trump, who never held office until he was president. Well, you're putting a different standard on me, but I won't even make the racial uh, application there. We vote well, for listen, you. Listen, at the age of 18... 
at the age of 18, I think you persuaded me on that one that political experience is not the same as holding office. Oh, to tell you the truth, the so, reason so I came out there out and, right and I was intrigued. Press, can I put out <laughs> right wing press that Sharpton converted a young? Well, I, I don't want to take credit for to you. To believe because... outside of political experience, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. One of the things, I'll even give you one more for you, okay? You were the only anti war candidate back then. I was against the Iraq War. As I recall, you were the only anti war candidate in either party. Well, guess what? Tables turn now. I'm the only true anti-war candidate in either political party now when it comes to Ukraine. I believe in America first policies. I think this Ukraine war does not advance American interests. I was the only person with the courage to say that on the Republican debate stage last week. The, the real war I would take on is the war against the administrative state, the shadow government here at home. I think the people who we elect to run the government once again ought to be the people who actually run the government, not the cancerous bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. I'll have a 75 percent headcount reduction for all of the people who weren't elected in Washington, D.C. So this is a very different vision than you hear amongst traditional Democrats, for sure. But even amongst traditional Republicans, I want to shut down the administrative state. I want to declare independence from China. I want to grow our economy by drilling and fracking and embracing energy. And I want to revive national pride in this country. That's not a Republican idea or a Democratic vision. It is a pro-American vision. But I, but That's what I, I stand I, I for. Take issue, in this race. I would take issue that when I opposed the war in Iraq and going for weapons of mass destruction that wasn't there, so I ended up being right. You can't compare that to the United States supporting Ukraine defending itself against Russia. So that, that's Look, not I think the there's a myth thing. that Ukraine's actually, I think I was against the Iraq war then, but I'm consistent now. Ukraine is not some democracy that we've now painted it to be. I think this is a, a Ukraine regime that is is a really has some place serious for flaws the United as well. States. Ukraine is in a, so I think I respectfully a, a strategic disagree with you. place where uh, I respectfully we have disagree that I do not think. That but all right, all right, we can agree to disagree on Ukraine that. Ukraine is Let not a NATO ally, issue, and, Let, and Ukraine does advance U.S. interests. We disagree so that's one of the things that's distinctive about that. my views. We disagree respectfully yep. on that. Now, NBC is reporting that you were once a recipient of a fellowship for immigrants and children of immigrants from the Soros Foundation. You were awarded the fellowship in 2011 to support your studies at Yale Law School. And the issue is that you, the child of Indian immigrants, are now accusing some immigrants of carrying out an invasion of the United States. And that as president, yeah. you would make it more difficult for That's children right. of immigrants born here to participate in the political process. The floor is yours to explain how you enjoyed from it that you shopped and convinced you could run for president. Soros helped you through college. Explain all <laughs> Come of this. On. <laughs> So, so you know what's really kind of funny about this? That you draw a distinction between legal and illegal immigrants like it doesn't exist. And I think that's a major problem in this country. I think that we need to use our own military to secure our own southern border. Not an armed invasion across somebody else's random border, but across our own border right here in the United States of America. I stand for that. I believe in the rule of law. My parents came to this country legally through the front door, followed the rules, paid their taxes, raised two kids. Both of us went on to found companies that helped thousands of Americans. But that also means that your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. That's part of what it means to be an American. We believe in the rule of law. Right. So, yes, I want to end so, funding so for sanctuary cities that you end no foreign problem. aid to Mexico and other countries. You, you have no problem Illegal immigration, with helping, I am a hardliner on. Absolutely. You, you have no problem with helping those immigrants that come here and follow the law and become citizens. I want to help every legal citizen of this country. That's what America first means, putting every American first. And you see how I run this campaign? It's very different. I've gone to the south side of Chicago, to Kensington, in the middle of Philadelphia. Right. I haven't called Zelensky, but I have called people in West Maui. America first means every American. All right, let me but ask that you means this. you have let, to come to this country this. legally, not illegally. Let me ask you this. You say we run the country with a, uh, a nation of laws and that we ought to follow the laws. Then how can you and your yes. colleagues stand on a debate stage and say that you would endorse and support for president a man if he was convicted of breaking the law and a felony in Donald Trump? How can you say I will put a convict back in the White House and you say that I'm the way our constitution the law? and laws of this country work? 
First of all, I'm running to be the next president, and I expect to be the next president because I want to reunite this country in a way that we badly need. But I have made a pledge to be on that debate stage, and I intend to keep it because I think the way we do things in the United States of America is that the people of this country get to decide who governs, not the administrative police state. So for better or worse, if it's a guy I disagree with or a guy I agree I'm with, talking in about this case, Donald Trump, I do agree with most of his policies. Of the, crime. But the question posed way, to you all you gotta was follow the Constitution. was you have to follow the Constitution. Of a crime. If the Constitution is clear. So the if he's Constitution of does not eliminate you. Conduct, he's eliminated. Let, 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 let me then put it to you this the way. The Constitution governs. I believe in the Constitution, and the Constitution says we have a process for picking presidents in this country. I think we should follow it. I expect to follow it. I expect if to be the next president, president. But even if it's not me, I will support anyone who follows that process. If you became president, if you became president, yeah. would you pardon Donald Trump? for any of the crimes that he's been indicted for or if he's convicted? On the current facts that we have, he is one of many people that I have identified as someone I would pardon because I do not think that this sets a good precedent for our country, where a so, party in so power uses police force even to indict its have, political opponents in the middle of an election. Before, there are Democrats on well, that list. Wait a minute. He's, it you've got matter. 19 people indicted. They're not running all of them. But even before you've heard the evidence, before the trials, you're saying that you would prejudge what is going to come out and try and commit to pardoning nope. them. That's not Yet correct. You claim That's not correct. I've actually, been, I've actually been very clear on this, Reverend. Assuming that the prosecution statement of the facts in the indictment is the worst version of the facts, then yes, I would. So I waited till I read the indictments cover to cover. In 99% of prosecutions, you and any lawyer will also know this. That's the worst statement of the facts you're going to get for the defense. But it's not all that's going to come out of trial. In you and I know that. That's so, not all so that's going to come out of trial. So what I said is assuming, well... I was very clear at the time. I said, I've read the indictment, and assuming these are the worst facts, then yes, on these facts, I will pardon Trump. Just as, by the way, I've said I would pardon Julian Assange, who, by my best guess, has very different politics than again, I do. DBA, because, again, we applied a different point, standard to Julian point. Assange. Because when you talk That's about the, the law, you've also said that, uh, uh, I remember there was a the big argument about you saying that uh, people having the right to guns had something to do with slavery. When the Second Amendment was in 1791, slavery didn't end into 1865. I mean, you're very, very... Well, I can actually, I can actually share with you something about this. Chief Justice Taney, and you and I probably have some common ground here, in the Dred Scott case, which said that black people could not be citizens in the U.S., shamefully, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court gave his argument for why. He said it would allow black people to own guns in this country. That is shameful. Yes, it is part of our history. But just because but some people may be for gun Second control Amendment today, to we can't sweep that black. under the rug. They didn't do the Second Amendment to help. Blacks couldn't get guns and fight. There were no, uh, uh, they were not fighting to give blacks guns. And when Taney said that, Clearly so literally, was, that was the justification in the Dred Scott case for why black people couldn't be citizens. Dred Scott's decision was not in 1791, by the way. But one last thing. It was before it was before the Civil War, as you well know. And I think that we and, should and, confront exactly our history right. and, we could and have not, an open we could and not honest debate about it. That's what makes vote. us stronger as a country. Until the 13th we gotta Amendment, we could vote our history our and confront it. Let, let me ask you one last question. We're out of time. And that's well, how we I, unite I, this one country. One thing we have in common with Trump is you've yeah. been criticized for trafficking in conspiracy theories. So here goes, do you believe, let me ask you this, because you and Trump mm -hmm. have both, both been accused of trafficking conspiracy theories. Do you believe Barack Obama was born in the United States, and do you think it was appropriate for Trump to suggest to otherwise, even as evidence mounted, that the claim was a lie? I think I have every reason to believe Obama was born in the U.S., and I have never brought up that issue, and I have no idea why we're actually discussing that. But what I have talked about is, for example, Saudi Arabia was absolutely involved in 9-11, despite the fact that our government refused to acknowledge it, that COVID-19 did originate in a lab in China, despite the fact that our government called that a conspiracy theory, that we still haven't seen the transgender shooter manifesto out of Nashville. So Should those aren't conspiracy Donald theories. Trump those are conspiracy realities. That's what matters. Barack Obama was born in Kenya. He's a man that you said was the best president I this have, century. Should he have continued trafficking the Kenya lie about Barack as Obama? A, 
Look, I will say as a presidential candidate before he ran for president, I think he made absolutely the right decision to say that that was a ridiculous theory. Barack Obama was born in the United States. And frankly, I don't think we should dignify the things that aren't true versus All talking right. about the hard things go. that were labeled conspiracy theories, but that are true now. So I actually believe in truth over theory. I'm tied to facts. All right. Well, you, you uh, yeah. certainly came and you knew I was going to fight it out with you and you stood up. Did about three or four ducks, threw a couple.